Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining DocuSign's second quarter fiscal 2021 earnings conference call. As a reminder, this call is being recorded and will be available for replay from the Investor Relations section of the website following the call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. A question and answer session will follow the formal presentation. If anyone should require operator assistance during the conference, please press star zero on your telephone keypad. I will now pass the call over to Annie Lishin, Head of Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Thank you, Operator. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to DocuSign's second quarter fiscal year 21 earnings conference call. On the call with me today, we have DocuSign CEO Dan Springer and CFO Mike Sheridan. The press release announcing our second quarter results was issued earlier today and is posted on our investor relations website. Before we get started, I'd like to let everyone know that we plan to participate virtually in several events in the upcoming weeks. First, the DA Davidson 19th Annual Software and Internet Conference on September 9th, City's 2020 Global Technology Conference on September 10th, Deutsche Bank Technology Conference on September 14th, and Jeffrey's Virtual Software Conference on September 15th. As other events come up, we'll make additional announcements. Now let me remind everyone that some of the statements on today's call are forward-looking. We believe our assumptions and expectations related to those forward-looking statements are reasonable, but they are subject to known and unknown risks and uncertainties that may cause our actual results or performance to be materially different. In particular, our expectations around the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on our business, financial condition, and results of operations are subject to change. Please read and consider the risk factors in our filings with the SEC together with the content of this call. Any forward-looking statements are based on our assumptions and expectations to date, and except as required by law, we assume no obligation to update these statements in light of future events or new information. During this call, we will present GAAP and non-GAAP financial measures. Non-GAAP financial measures exclude stock-based compensation expenses, employer payroll tax on employee stock transactions, amortization of acquired intangible assets, amortization of debt discount and issuance costs from our notes, acquisition-related expenses, and, as applicable, other special items. In addition, we provide non-GAAP weighted average share counts and information regarding free cash flows and billing. These non-GAAP measures are not intended to be considered in isolation from, nor substitute for, or superior to our GAAP results. We encourage you to consider all measures when analyzing our performance. For information regarding our non-GAAP financial information, the most directly comparable GAAP measures and a quantitative reconciliation of those figures, please refer to today's press release, which can be found on our website at investor.docusign.com. I'd now like to turn the call over to Dan. Dan? Thanks, Annie. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our second quarter earnings call for fiscal 2021. I appreciate everyone joining us today, and I'd like to cover four key areas of the business with you the evolution of COVID-19 and the impact we're seeing on our business, the essential role that eSignature and the Agreement Cloud continue to play in the digital transformation of our customers' businesses around the world, our recent acquisition to accelerate the opportunity in remote online notary, and a few additions to the board and executive team, including Mike Sheridan's new international leadership role. So let's start with the evolving dynamics of the pandemic. It would be an understatement to say that we're all still experiencing significant changes in the way that we work and live as a result, result of COVID-19. We're seeing it with our more than 5,000 employees around the world, as we don't expect to return to an office environment until June of next year. As a team, we're focused on helping each other adapt to these changing circumstances and to balance the myriad demands on our collective time. We're seeing it with our customers too. I spoke last quarter about how so many of them faced a sudden need to transition to remote work when the pandemic first hit. Today, that need has evolved from an initial crisis response to a business necessity. And because agreements are central to doing business, the need to agree electronically and remotely has never been stronger. This is causing greater adoption of our offerings, something we believe will persist beyond the crisis. Because in our experience, it's very rare to see anyone go back to paper once they've gone digital. 
The upshot of all this is that DocuSign is becoming an increasingly essential cloud software platform for organizations of all types and sizes, a fact that is well reflected in our Q2 results. Billings grew 61% year over year to $406 million, and revenue grew 45% to $342 million. We added more than 88,000 new customers, bringing our total to nearly three quarters of a million worldwide. For perspective, we acquired more new customers in the first half of this year than we did in all of last year. Our operating margins and cash flows reached record levels, while we continued to make key investments to address the heightened demand. As is evident from these numbers, the trends that emerged in the latter half of Q1 have continued throughout Q2. We've seen a sustained rise in demand for our core e-signature offering, not only from new customers, but also those expanding across use cases, departments, and borders. The interest in transforming other parts of the agreement process is growing too, and that in turn creates pipeline for the rest of the agreement cloud suite. Now let me give you some examples of recent customer wins and expansions. One of our largest retail customers runs a network of healthcare clinics within its stores. When COVID-19 hit, the company accelerated plans to provide telehealth services using DocuSign eSignature to handle consents and other paperwork remotely. This is a great example of COVID-accelerated demand that we see as durable. Now, telehealth will remain after COVID-19, but the paperless processes that came with it will likely end up getting implemented for in-person clinic visits too, because the electronic way is more efficient and a better experience than paper and clipboards. Another example is from a large financial institution that's a longtime DocuSign customer. The company already used eSignature widely, but when COVID-19 hit, it accelerated plans for further rollouts, and together we helped activate 11 new lines of business. This illustrates a pattern we're seeing where established customers are now bringing e-signature to new divisions, departments, and regions. This was going to happen at some point, but it's just happening faster now. Finally, I have a few examples from an area of the economy I know you're all interested in, the public sector. To date, we've held a strong competitive position at the local, state, and federal levels here in the United States. This quarter, we built on that base with a healthy mix of e-signature and multi-product agreement cloud deals, including DocuSign CLM and our identity family of products. We helped a major city deploy a digitized workflow to handle applications for housing assistance. And we enabled a federal agency to capture applications and distribute relief funds to healthcare providers on the front lines of coronavirus response. So, in summary, it was an exceptional quarter for customer growth and expansion. Economic headwinds did cause some to request relief, but that was more than offset by increased demand overall. And while DocuSign faces the same economic uncertainty as everyone else, we remain optimistic about our ability to deliver increasing and durable value no matter where business is conducted. I'd like to move on now to how we're investing in innovation and new agreement cloud product offerings. Specifically, I'd like to talk about our acquisition in July of Live Oak Technologies, an Austin-based startup that was already a close partner of ours. For agreements that would normally require people to be together in person, Live Oak enables the transaction to be done remotely via video conferencing. The company's platform includes several other technologies specific to remote agreements too, such as video identity verification, collaborative form filling, an integration with DocuSign eSignature, and a detailed audit trail. With this acquisition, we will leverage Live Oak's technology to accelerate the launch of DocuSign Notary a solution for remote online notarization where signeries and the notary public are in different places. DocuSign Notary will do for notarization what eSignature did for signing. It will enable a dramatically better experience for everyone involved from wherever they may be. We believe this is a natural extension of our eSignature business 
And once people use remote online notarization, we don't expect them to go back. In fact, when we announced this move, the customer response was very clearly, how soon can I get it? And the answer is the DocuSign Notary is slated for beta release later this year. The initial version will be for existing customers that already have a notary capability within their organization, or what we call first-party notary. And we expect to enable third-party notaries in the near future. Now, before I close out my remarks, I wanted to share a few enhancements to our board and executive team. I'm thrilled to share that Teresa Briggs and James Beer have recently joined our board of directors. Teresa is assuming the role of audit committee chair, and she brings a wealth of financial experience from Deloitte, as well as fantastic and relevant board experience at ServiceNow and Snowflake. James has extensive financial experience as CFO at Atlassian today, previously at American Airlines, McKesson, and Symantec, all of which will be invaluable as we continue to scale our business. On the executive team, we have appointed Kamal Hafi as Chief Technology Officer, reporting into Tom Casey. In this new role, Kamal will oversee the development and execution of our overall technology roadmap. Given his 20-plus year run at Microsoft and his recent experience at Trader Interactive, we believe Kamal is the ideal person to build the platform that powers the agreement cloud as it continues to scale. I'm also excited to announce that I'm promoting Mike Sheridan to the role of President of International at DocuSign, and that Cynthia Gaylor, a current board member and audit committee chair, will be joining as our new CFO. As you've heard me say in almost every call to date, our international business is a key growth driver for us. International growth was over 60% this quarter, and its contribution to our overall business is increasing. Since the beginning of this year, Mike has been spearheading our growth initiatives across EMEA. Given the strong results of his efforts there, we are now broadening his scope to drive growth across all inter international markets. So I couldn't be more pleased for Mike and for DocuSign to be doubling down on international. Of course, we couldn't do this if we didn't have access to a CFO like Cynthia. She brings more than 25 years of finance and capital markets experience with an extensive background in strategy and operations, as well as a deep understanding of enterprise and consumer software. Most recently, she was the CFO of Pivotal Software, prior to which she led corporate development at Twitter and was a managing director in the Morgan Stanley Technology Group. I'm looking forward to working closely with Cynthia in an operating capacity as we continue to drive the business forward. As Mike and I worked through the scope of his new role over the past few months, we also collaborated with Cynthia so she could hit the ground running. She will continue to partner closely with Mike and myself over the next several months to ensure a strong and seamless transition. So with that, I'd like to welcome Cynthia to the team and to again congratulate Mike on his new role. I'll close this out by saying that the catalysts for further digital transformation remain strong, and we firmly believe DocuSign can continue to deliver value across the entire agreement cycle. And our strong Q2, combined with the momentum we're seeing as we enter Q3, gives us confidence in this business. While the pandemic continues to have an unpredictable effect on the market at large, we will stay nimble and will continue to do everything we can to help our customers, partners, and employees adapt, transform, and move forward. Now, let me turn over to Mike for a deeper dive on the financials and some comments on his new role. Mike? Thanks, Dan, and good afternoon, everyone. Before I get into my comments on the corner quarter, I'd like to thank Dan and the board for entrusting me with my new role as president of International. We have a great strength in our international operations today that has achieved impressive growth over the last several years. I look forward to working with this great team to expand upon this success. I also want to welcome and congratulate Cynthia Gaylor as our new CFO. As Dan mentioned, he and I have had the opportunity over the last couple of years to work with Cynthia as a board member, and during that time, she has become very familiar with DocuSign's financial operations. I am confident that Cynthia will hit the ground running as she joins the team. Turning to our Q2 results, 
Strong sales led by our e-signature solutions drove a 61% year-over-year increase in billings to $406 million. This also drove a 45% year-over-year increase in total revenue to $342 million in the second quarter. Subscription revenue increased 47% year-over-year to $324 million. We saw particular strength outside the U.S. as total international revenue grew over 59% year-over-year to $67 million. This quarter, we added over 88,000 new customers. Of those, over 10,000 were direct customers, an increase of 55% year-over-year. This brings our total customer base to nearly 749,000 worldwide, with over 99,000 direct customers. Strong e-signature expansions and upsells into our existing customer base led to a record dollar net retention rate of 120% in the quarter. Customers with ACVs greater than $300,000 grew 41% year over year to a total of 520 customers. Total non-GAAP gross margin for the second quarter was 78%, consistent with a year ago. Subscription gross margin was 83%, compared with 84% a year ago. Margins were impacted by our SEAL acquisition, as well as by investments we made in our data center capacity, particularly for hosted services, to ensure our ability to meet significantly higher transaction volumes. Non-GAAP operating expenses totaled $233 million, or 68% of total revenue in the quarter, compared with $185 million, or 78% of total revenue in Q2 last year. We generated $34 million in non-GAAP operating profit, or a 10% operating margin in the quarter. This compares with an operating loss of less than $1 million in the second quarter last year. Non-GAAP net income was $35 million in the second quarter, compared with $2 million in the second quarter of last year. We ended the quarter with 5,008 employees, an increase of 44% over the second quarter of last year. Turning to cash flow, operating cash flow in the second quarter increased nearly 350% year over year to $118 million, compared with $26 million in the same quarter a year ago. Free cash flow came in at $100 million in the quarter, compared with $12 million a year ago. CapEx increased during the quarter due to leasehold improvements in Brazil, as well as the completion of our federal data center. <clears throat> now let me turn to guidance. We anticipate total revenue of 358 to $362 million in Q3 and $1.384 to $1.388 billion for fiscal 21. Of this total, we expect subscription revenue of $343 to $347 million in Q3, and $1.315 to $1.319 billion for fiscal 21. For billings, we expect $380 to $390 million in Q3, and $1.623 to $1.643 billion for fiscal 21. We expect non-GAAP gross margin to be 78 to 80% for both Q3 and fiscal 21. For operating expenses, we expect sales and marketing in the range of 46 to 48% of revenues for Q3 and 45 to 47% for fiscal 21. R&D in the range of 14 to 16% for Q3 and for fiscal 21. And finally, G&A in the range of 9% to 11% for Q3 and for fiscal 21. For non-GAAP interest in other, we expect $1 million of expense to $1 million of income. And for fiscal 21, we expect four to $6 million of non-GAAP interest and non-operating income. We expect a tax provision of approximately two to $3 million for Q3 and seven to $9 million for fiscal 21. 
Finally, we expect fully diluted weighted average shares outstanding of 200 to 205 million shares for Q3 and fiscal 21. Thanks for joining us today, and we will now open the call for Q&A. Thank you. At this time, we will be conducting a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. A confirmation tone will indicate your line is in the question queue. You may press star 2 if you would like to remove your question from the queue. For participants using speaker equipment, it may be necessary to pick up your handset before pressing the star keys. One moment, please, while we poll for questions. Your first question comes from a line of Sterling Auti with J.P. Morgan. Please proceed with your question. Yeah, thanks. Hi, guys. First, Mike, congratulations on the promotion and running international. If Cynthia is there, congratulations on the new role as CFO. Uh, just on the idea of, of international, Mike, maybe you can give us an update on the status of where the go-to-market, the percentage of revenue coming from international and what investments are necessary to drive that business going forward? Yeah, thanks, Sterling. Um, a couple of things. I would say that if you look at the scale of international today, it's over $200 million in revenue, and the team is executing very well. I just reported a 59% year-over-year increase in, in revenue. So there's definitely growth already being achieved. If you think about that scale, it's similar to what DocuSign was about five years ago when I joined DocuSign. Uh, that at that time, DocuSign was also a very rapidly growing organization. So as we've looked at it, many of the challenges that we needed to deal with at that stage of the total company are showing themselves uh, in our international region. So much of the work that I'm going to be doing is going to look a lot like the work that, uh, that we've been working on over the last several years as we scale the whole business. Um, I think what really makes this work is um, in my role as CFO, um, I've worked on so many of the very same kinds of issues. I've developed strong uh, relationships with the executive uh, staff uh, in headquarters as well as the leaders across uh, the globe. So we have a lot of foundation. In terms of what the, uh, the nature of the investments are going to be, I think we're tracking well. I think a lot of what we're seeing is that the structure of our international operations today look like what um, they were when we formed them, you know, four, five, six years ago, which is direct line reporting into, uh, into headquarters, which is appropriate. But I think what I can bring is a, uh, a greater focus into that area where I can work with the executive members as well as the, the regional leaders to figure out um, how they work together across those reporting lines um, to, to figure out what are the right uh, in-region investments and structures that, uh, that can drive that growth further. Great. And then one quick follow-up in terms of the gross margin, you know, specifically the subscription gross margin, comments on kind of where we are in, in the scale and you know, what we should expect trend-wise from that line going forward. Yeah, so the guidance that I provided shows that uh, they're going to, for the, uh, for the uh, period of time through the end of this fiscal year, stay in those um, high 70s to low 80 kind of range. There was one impact in Q2 that related to our acquisition of SEAL, which had an impact on the margin that was slightly uh, diluted as, as we anticipated. The other impact on margins uh, right now is that, as I mentioned, we have pretty significant increases in our transaction volumes. And so we're continuing to build out our infrastructure, uh, data center infrastructure and other to ensure that we kind of keep our SLAs tracking um, as, we're, as we're consuming those greater transaction volumes. So uh, we're, we're absorbing those into the existing margins, but I think they're gonna be stable at, at that level to the end of the fiscal year. Great, thank you. Your next question comes from line of Stan Zlotsky with Morgan Stanley. Please proceed with your question. Perfect. Um, thank you so much, and uh, congratulations on a, on a very strong quarter. Um, from my end, uh, the the thing that I, I, I want to dig into is um, what are you seeing as far as the pull through of the the rest of the. DocuSign suite with into your existing install base of e-signature customers. So things like you know your Spring CM, CLM product, Seal, uh, and then I have a quick follow up. Yeah. So, um, so so Stan, I think what we're seeing is sort of what we talked about last quarter uh, continue the uh, dramatic pull from our customers and prospects uh, for e-signature with the very high 
you know, enablement time, the very quick ROI, and just the need for people to uh, take that first step into the agreement cloud, and that's how most people do enter into agreement cloud, is through e-signature. That's been the, that's the headline story. And if we look at our growth, it's been more significant in the traditional aspects of our business than any other part. Um, and, and we're very clear when we go to our field, we say that you have to, when you talk to customers and you talk to prospects, you start off every conversation with DocuSign's Agreement Cloud company. Let me tell you how we're going to help you prepare, sign, act on, and manage your agreements. And if that individual says to you, uh, yeah, I'd like to buy some e-signature to get started right now, the only appropriate answer is yes, sir, or yes, ma'am. I'm happy to sell you some e-signature. And that's what we're going to continue to do through this period of time. We want to really support what the customers are needing. But at the same time, as I mentioned up front, we're seeing a lot of people saying the concept of the agreement cloud is, is really something they're embracing, and they're saying we'd love to figure out a way to broaden the relationship with DocuSign. We believe that things like uh, DocuSign CLM, which is the, with the Spring CM product that we've turned it into here, uh, will continue to be uh, strong. We see a lot of demand. We're building a lot of pipe for it. And the customers that we're bringing in right now, think about those 88,000 new customers, many of those will be prospects for uh, CLM in the future, but we believe that the sales cycle there will always be a little bit longer. They're more complex. Uh, usually there's a, a services component, right? So it has to be a statement of work uh, calculated and done. And a lot of times I think we're seeing uh, CIOs and CFOs at our customers today are saying, I want to do that, but right now I need to get these signature pieces enabled. Let's do that now. And as we get later into the year and more settled and, and settled down in their company is where I think we'll see increased demand and pull through of those other components. Perfect. Um, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, maybe one uh, for Mike. Mike, congratulations on uh, on the promotion uh, to lead the international. Um, and uh, just on the on the quarter net revenue retention, uh, obviously very impressive, 120 percent result. Um, how should we think about net revenue retention uh, moving forward versus your, your uh, more traditional 112 to 119 range? That's it for me. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Um, yeah, we obviously for the last couple of quarters have uh, have been at the higher end of that range. Actually, this quarter we exceeded it a little bit. I'm not going to update a guidance range for it. Um, we will be upgrading that uh, guidance range when we provide guidance for fiscal 22. Uh, but with that said, um, I think uh, what we've seen in these recent quarters in terms of real strengthening um, around uh, our dollar net retention and our ability to upsell uh, into our installed base should keep us on the uh, higher half of that range. All right, perfect. Thank you so much. Your next question comes from line of Alex Zukin with RBC. Please proceed with your question. Hey, guys. Thanks for taking my questions. Congratulations all around on the quarter of the promotions, uh, et cetera. I guess maybe uh, just two for me. First one for Dan. Dan, are, you know, are trends – what can you tell us about trends on kind of a monthly basis uh, and linearity, both on kind of the mid-market and the enterprise? Do, do you feel like around even engagement, are, are, you, are we kind of momentum and now you're starting to see more of a return to normal adoption, or is, or is it still – are trends still accelerating? Uh, so in terms of uh, two, two things, one is we, we have a sort of a linearity and we do a lot of our forecasting. We look at how quarters build across uh, the month. And the one thing I would tell you in the last couple of quarters, we've seen some, um, I would call it positive trend where we are having less of a back end weight to our quarter. Um, and I would say that, you know, you'd expect that, of course, to be on our web and mobile business, which tends to have relatively even linearity, right? Uh, whereas an enterprise, of course, it had the biggest back weighting in the quarter. But we're seeing it across the board, even with the enterprise, uh, more evenness. I think some of that is execution on our part. I think we're putting a lot of focus on thinking about monthly closes just as, versus just quarterly closes. But I would also tell you that um, uh, I believe in the marketplace, we're just seeing demand being stronger. Uh, and so people are coming to us uh, through all parts of the quarter just trying to get deals done. So we're probably seeing some positivity there. But that, that's the, the – I don't think there's been a dramatic change, and I don't think we see anything in the way we're forecasting. Uh, Michael, if you see something different, feel free to share it. But I think we're not seeing a lot of, a lot of dramatic change, just a slight improvement uh, in that, and it gives us more predictability uh, as we look through the quarter. Got it. And then maybe for Mike, um, 
you know, look, the, the, the Billings growth of the first half is nothing short of extraordinary. I don't think anybody would, would kind of speak otherwise around that. The guidance for the second half uh, does look like a pretty different kind of growth trajectory. So I guess the, 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 the obvious question is, is there any pull-in activity that you saw around large enterprise deals in, in kind of this quarter of the first half? Because I would assume that, you know, you're now getting into your big enterprise renewal conversations in the second half and period, and that should actually, you know, potentially drive even even more, uh, you know, large deal conversations and be a net benefit uh, even more so for, for net expansion. Yeah, so I would say a couple things, Alex. I think in Q3, our guidance has uh, billings growth year over year well into the uh, 40 percentiles. So I do feel like, um, you know, we're off to a good start in Q3, and, and it's reflected in the guidance like we talked about in the past. There's a lot of variables. Dan alluded to it in his uh, uh, comments that um, we're subject to, like everybody else. We're trying to, uh, to, to figure them out uh, real time. Uh, we feel very good about the second half. Um, we guide what, what we can see. We don't, uh, we don't guess. We always aspire for the highest uh, level of growth we can accomplish, but I think uh, the guidance is is uh, reasonably is reasonably reasonably balanced and uh, and positive. Perfect. Thank you, guys. Your next question comes from the line of Rob Owens with Piper Sandler. Please proceed with your question. Great. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I want to drill down a little bit into the the acquisitions and. I guess starting with with Seal, obviously you uh, announced some big improvements to contract analytics, and just want to know how far down the path you are at this point. How much raw R and D you're going to have to spend moving forward, and you know when when it's going to kind of achieve your vision. Well, I think when we talk about Seal, starting off, Rob, I think the answer is there was always two parts to this, and we're still excited about both. One was there's uh, sort of intelligent insights, which is sort of the core agreement analytics product that we've been partnering uh, you know, with uh, CL on when they were a partner before the acquisition. And we continue to see that that's going to be something that a lot of our customers are going to want to do. Uh, and we're very excited about that. And then the second piece was about integrating the CL AI technology into our CLM offering. So, you know, as you saw, when uh, the, the Gartner report came out on CLM, we were the only two companies that were in that upper right-hand quadrant. And we feel we had a fantastic entry with DocuSign CLM. And yet we also felt internally the place where we had the biggest improvement opportunity was to really integrate agreement analytics into that CLM product. And so that is the second big piece. So on the first one, Intelligent Insights, I mean, I think we're there. I think it was a product that was fairly uh, you know, uh, close to standalone. There were some things we needed to do uh, to make it DocuSign quality, let's, let, let's call it that, uh, you know, in terms of things like security and reliability. And, and we're still making investments on that front. But I would say we say that that product is pretty much ready for prime time, and our people are now out uh, aggressively selling that uh, into our base. In terms of the integration with CLM, that's something that's still, you know, quarters away. We, we, we still have a lot of uh, engineering and R&D work, as you referred to it, uh, to, to make that, uh, fulfill that promise we have for our CLM product. We're, it's going very well. I think we're highly confident, but we think that will be, you know, early next year before I can really put my hand on my heart and tell you that work is complete and the DocuSign CLM product has a fully integrated advanced agreement analytics functionality, uh, one that will allow us to be significantly uh, stronger than other players in the market. And I guess quickly around the Live Oak acquisition, how much does that increment your TAM? And can you just speak to the broader opportunity there? Yeah, yeah. So TAM is actually a really interesting topic within the notary space. Uh, we've taken a couple of looks at it. We've looked at other reports. What we're basically saying we think this approaches uh, about a billion dollars. So if you look at this and you think about it in the construct of a $25 billion TAM for signature, you know, it's not a dramatic increase, but it's a really nice piece. And the bigger side of it for us is so many of our customers have said to us, you know, we really would love to have a notary capability, and particularly for those larger customers that have uh, what, what we call first-party notary. They already have uh, a notary capability in their business. They really are excited to integrate this into their offering. We see that a lot with the financial institutions who have been pushing us. So as much as anything, this is like a feature enhancement that we think, well, it has a nice, you know, a billion bucks. That's not a bad uh, increment to go after. Uh, but it's not, it's not like sort of an um, earth-shattering uh, change in our business. We look at this as a really nice tuck-in that our customers are asking for. Um, and it's a good piece for us to go after. And then it opens the opportunity to go after the third-party 
notary space. I mean, tend, people tend to think about that, the individual notaries that are you know, driving around for people to do real estate transactions. And we would love to then really transform that business as well, uh, as so many uh, customers have come to us and said in the past, that would be you know, a, a great uh, opportunity for DocuSign to make their lives a, a little more agreeable. Great. Thank you very much. Your next question comes from the line of Pat Wall Ravens with JMP Securities. Please proceed with your question. Oh, great. Thank you. And um, congratulations, Mike. I love the move from uh, the financial role to the operating role. That's awesome. Uh, Thanks, so here's Pat. my question for you, Dan, and I've asked a bunch of CEOs this question um, this quarter, which is, how do you make DocuSign the best place to work when everybody is working from home? <laughs> If I had the answer to that one, I would be uh, selling it in a lot of different ways, Pat, for sure. But I can tell you this. Um, the good news is because we had built such a, such a strong culture, and that's why our Glassdoor you know, scores are so high and we do so well on those you know, best places to work uh, surveys and why our, our, you know, in our own surveys our employee engagement is so high, it's because we've built a fantastic culture where people really believe in our values and fundamentally they're excited to work at a place that puts customer success as our top priority, even above our financial uh, results, uh, and people get excited about you know the pride they have for working here. None of that has changed. Um, while it's harder to have those uh, you know personal connections to people uh, when we don't have people coming into the office, and each day that goes by, a bigger percentage of DocuSigners have never met personally one of their colleagues. Uh, we'll about, we're about to cross over a thousand DocuSigners that have joined since we were doing uh, remote uh, you know uh, office work. So um, it's going to get uh, tougher and tougher, and I think the real answer is increased communications. We are looking at changing up the mix of communications, and some of the things are harder, but I'll tell you something else. Some of the things are better, and I'll just give you one example, Pat. So in the past, we had an event called Discovering DocuSign, where we would invite people when they join, shortly after they join, to Seattle, which is where the company was founded, and they met with a bunch of other new DocuSigners, and we had different executives come in and talk to them about the company over a couple of days. I didn't get to attend that very often just because my schedule and what I need, I couldn't always be there. In fact, I started to be there less and less. Now that we do that as a remote event, I'm there every time. So every new DocuSign employee, it could be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on how you look at it, Pat, but they get an opportunity to meet Dan Springer. Um, and we get to create, create a connection. And yeah. quite a few of them send me emails right afterwards, and we've now built a different kind of connection. So it's remote, but we're figuring out creative ways to find different communication uh, styles and techniques to put us into a place where I think we can continue to make this the place for people to do the work of their lives. Uh, but it's an ever, you know, this is this is not one that's going to be over uh, quickly. We're going to have to continue to be creative to do it if we want to continue to earn that uh, great relationship we have with our employees. Thanks, Dan. Your next question comes from the line of Walter Pritchard with City. Please proceed with your question. Hi, a couple of questions on the sales and marketing side. Your your growth in spending there is is uh, been uh, decelerating over the last three quarters, and understanding there's there's expenses like T&E and so forth that are not part of that. How uh, what are you doing to build sales capacity over the next uh, you know six months, and how do you think about uh, driving sales once we get into the situation where maybe uh, people's hair aren't on fire and COVID is is uh, you know at least we've worked through it, it being more of a normalized situation as opposed to uh, the situation we're in right now. Yeah, so a couple things. Um, well, I would say on, on capacity, uh, there, we, we are continuing to, to expand our capacity pretty aggressively, as you saw from the, uh, the hiring statistics that, uh, that I had mentioned. Um, we're now over 5,000 employees, uh, year-over-year growth of 44%. A substantial amount of that is in our go-to-market organizations, not just on sales capacity, of course, marketing capacity as well, and, and customer success capacity. Um, and so uh, we, we, we are uh, endeavoring to stay ahead of the trends that we're seeing. Uh, we're looking at the, uh, the demand data very carefully to try to uh, forecast the trends and, and get ahead of that with, with capacity across the business. In terms of, you know, what, um, what will we anticipate post-COVID, I don't, I don't know that anybody has a great answer for that. It is our view that um, as we work through these difficult times, though, uh, there is a greater awareness of the need uh, to digitize the business, and we believe that that's going to be sustained um, even after things return to whatever normal looks like in the future. So 
Um, we do believe that we're entering into a period of a quote unquote new normal. It doesn't necessarily mean that the, the, the highs of any particular quarter are going to be sustained forever. But at the same time, we don't see trends that things are going to return to the way they looked and trended pre-COVID. So we're um, designing the business, we're designing our marketing activities and our sales activities to, uh, to stay on top of that as best as possible. Okay, thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Koji Iketo with Oppenheimer. Please proceed with your question. Hey, thanks for taking my quarter. Nice quarter, guys. Congrats to Mike on your new role, and congrats to Cynthia on your new role, too. too. Uh, just one question for me. On the sales process, you know, just thinking that now most of the world has been operating in this new pandemic environment for a while, um, have your sales conversations changed significantly? Are, are you seeing customers taking a step back now and, and looking at how to optimize workflows more strategically, you know, which could result in more platform-type conversations for you or maybe even broader adoption across the organization uh, as a starting point for implementing DocuSign? Yeah, you know, Coach, it's a really interesting question. Uh, one thing that's always hard in answering a question around sort of more tectonic shifts like that is what's behind it. Is it uh, maturation of our business? Is it related to COVID, et cetera? My view is from a COVID standpoint, which is the nature of your question, is we went through a period of time where people just got very focused six months ago on we just need to get um, things up and going quickly. We need to you know, work uh, in a remote environment, and we have certain use cases that we can't run our business, we can't figure them out. So it was not about uh, uh, navel-gazing and deep thought about their processes. It was about uh, getting some of these uh, primarily e-signature uh, workflows in place. And while I think there's still some of that for sure, that has definitely calmed down. And I think uh, the number of people that are, are, are rushing to us saying, um, I need to make a quick adjustment to be able to deal with remote, like that, if they haven't got it done by now, <laughs> they, I think they missed that window. Um, what we are seeing now is, is people saying, wow, this is fantastic. There are more places where I could leverage this in my business, and we're, and we're looking at expansion, as we talked about, of use cases within our base to more and more places that, that, as I said before, we only think they would have gotten there eventually. It just accelerated those, and we're continuing to see that acceleration of those workflows uh, into DocuSign because they, they, they realize how beneficial they are to their business. From a standpoint of that more platform thinking, I don't know that I would say I, I've seen that increase, and I don't know if I'd say this increase would be due to do COVID. The natural maturation for a lot of folks with us around the agreement cloud opportunity is as they start hearing us describe this future, they say, you know what, I could see you as a more strategic part of my sort of IT infrastructure uh, and my business process infrastructure. And so I think that's occurring more and more. But I think that's more to do with the fact that we're just getting bigger and having, you know, larger relationships with companies as we scale. You look at that number of customers above $300,000 is just sort of one measure. That keeps growing, right, substantially. And so I think that's driving it more than a COVID reaction. Um, but, again, it's hard, it, it's hard to – sort of, um, you know, se separate out each of those components, but that would be my view. Great. Thanks for taking my question. Appreciate it. Your next question comes from the line of Taylor McGinnis with Deutsche Bank. Please proceed with your question. Yeah, hi. Thanks so much for taking my question, and congrats again on a really strong quarter. So net retention rates have been really strong the last couple quarters, and but I believe so far that's largely been driven by e-signature related expansion. So I'm just curious what kind of levels you think net retention could hit once things like Spring CM or the broader agreement cloud start to become larger contributors, or maybe anything that you can just share on what those deal expansions have looked like so far um, when they include those products relative to just e-signature. Hi, Taylor. Um, yeah, a couple things. One, um, if you look at the scale of our e-signature business uh, compared to the scale of uh, the CLM and the data analytics or agreement, sorry, agreement analytics businesses, e-signature is, is dramatically larger. So that statistic is going, is going to largely succeed or, or not succeed based upon our success in, in e-signature, our upsells, our volume expansions, and all of those things. That is not to say that the agreement cloud expansions are not important. They are, but that is a much longer term uh, trajectory before you'll start to see them have a meaningful movement in a, in a broader statistic uh, like that. So uh, as we talk about those businesses and, and how they're growing and the comments that Dan made, um, I think those are all uh, critical, but in terms of a near-term quarter-to-quarter impact on something like dollar net retention, 
expansion, e-signature volumes are just going to overwhelm it so you won't see it so much uh, move a statistic like that. Got it. That makes a ton of sense. And then my, my last question is, I thought the inflection and international growth was really interesting. So just curious if there was any catalyst um, in the demand environment there that drove that or if you guys made any changes on, on the go to market front or if there was any just if there was anything to call it in particular. I think Mike's involvement in international Taylor has clearly been the driver in the increased growth there and around the company. We couldn't be more excited that he's off to such a good start. Uh, from your sense about the market, and I think it's mostly Mike's execution, but but for your sense about the market, I don't think we have seen anything different. You know, we have seen different levels of success in different geographies. It was phenomenal for us to be able to say that every single geography that we have uh, was above plan, you know, in the quarter. And it, it, we're in a bunch of geographies, so that's pretty impressive. Um, I would tell you there's some markets I was going to point, you know, to one that was particularly strong. I would say LATAM. And our Brazil team, you know, crushed it. But if I said to the area where I saw the most improvement, because we've been, you know, crushing it there for a while, I'd say it was Europe. Uh, and I think, uh, again, with uh, tongue out of my cheek, I'll say I do think, you know, Mike's leadership in Europe has helped us perform a little better there and execute better. Uh, and it's a big reason we're so excited for this, you know, broader expansion of his role into all of international. Um, but I also do think that we saw some some positive uh, demand characteristics. Uh, across Europe as well. So those would be my observations. And Mike, I don't know if you have anything different you're seeing. Yeah, I, I would add, I think, a couple of things. One is, um, going back to the capacity question earlier, we have been building international capacity. And as we see some of that capacity get through their ramp, we're starting to see better productivity. Uh, so that's a contributor. I think the pandemic impact is a global impact. We're seeing that. And remember, our international business, in terms of scale, um, isn't as large as the overall, so having a higher percentage on a, on a quote-unquote smaller scale is also a factor. Awesome. Thanks. Your next question comes from line of Rishi Jaluria with uh, Research Analyst. Proceed with your question. Hi, this is uh, Rishi Jaluria from DA Davidson. Thanks so much for taking my questions. Uh, and, and congrats to both Mike and Cynthia on, on your new roles. I uh, wanted to start by, by uh, talking about the Live Oak acquisition. Um, may, maybe just from a, from a technology perspective, you know, I know you can do video through that. Are, are there plans to kind of integrate that with other solutions out there, especially, you know, in this environment with so many people using tools uh, like Zoom? Uh, to, to, to start so that it's, you know, very natively integrated like you've been doing with the core DocuSign e-signature product for so long. Um, and, and then alongside that on, on, on Live Oak, you know, I see on, on their kind of customer base a lot of financial services and real estate. So, so you know, some of your strongest verticals. Uh, but do you see other verticals where there's potential to, to expand the solutions into? And then I've got a follow-up. Sure. Yeah. So, so a couple of thoughts there. First off, uh, I think you you hit it, the nail on the head that this opportunity for this collaboration, uh, leveraging things like video conferencing, it's a broad opportunity, and we're going to continue to be an open system for sure. And in fact, uh, Eric uh, Eric Wan, the CEO of Zoom, and I had a conversation about this. He is super excited, as are we, to expand our partnership and include their uh, platform that's uh, obviously fantastically successful uh, to sort of leverage that into integration with DocuSign. For these kinds of uh, for these kinds of programs, um, we believe the Live Oak guys have built some really nice uh, tools, and I mentioned some of those in my prepared remarks. But around really driving that collaboration. So, to use your example of financial services, if you're doing a uh, an opening of an account, and say you're a large bank, you know, sort of like a Bank America scale uh, customer of ours, and you used to have a lot of people opening accounts in your branches, and now your branches are closed you need to rapidly uh, adapt and be able to do that in a remote setting. But then what we think we're really excited about, once you've done that in the remote setting, that's a valuable, even in a post-COVID world, you can tell your customers, you don't have to come to the branch to open that account. You used to, you can if you want, like, but we also have this remote opportunity. And the same worker, whether they're sitting in the branch or sitting in a call center, can do that activity for you. We think that's super powerful. So we really want to build that out as an internal offering uh, and we think notary is just one of the components of it. Uh, but we, we believe that's going to continue to be a foundation for other people building on top of it, uh, a, a, as you mentioned. Um, in terms of other industries, um, yeah, financial services is a big one, but we can see this having a big impact in telecom. We see there's a lot of opportunity in healthcare life sciences. 
uh, where people are going to want to have, we talked about telehealth a little bit uh, on the call and some folks doing that. We think leveraging those same technologies to improve that experience for folks uh, is a big one. Uh, so we do think this will be uh, broad-based, but you're absolutely right. Financial services, a strength of theirs, I would argue a focus of theirs, and a strength of ours is the place we're probably going to see the most uh, uh, initial uh, focus on our joint efforts. Great. That's really helpful. And then just kind of a, a little bit of a, a financial question, but, um, you know, we've seen contract lengths kind of tick down a little bit, which is, I think, to be expected in this environment. Um, just mechanically, how should we be thinking about the potential headwinds that might have on, on future cash flow? Thanks. Hi. Uh, yeah, a couple things. I don't think on the cash flow piece of it, um, even on multi-year contracts, uh, we bill those annually. Um, so we wouldn't anticipate that it would really have an impact on trends around cash flow. Um, in terms of the contract length, you're right, it did tick down uh, slightly to 17 months last quarter, I think with 18 months. Um, and so what we're seeing in, um, in our bookings is we do have some weighting coming in on, on small to mid, that's having some impact. And we're also seeing some larger enterprises as everybody's navigating through the current economic situation. Um, being a little more conservative in terms of the length of contracts that uh, that they're signing up to. They're not massive changes, but those are kind of the two things that are, that are affecting that statistic. All right, wonderful. Thank you, guys. Your next question comes from the line of Kirk Materni with Evercore ISI. Please proceed with your question. Uh, thanks, and uh, congrats on the quarter and, and on the, the new roles for, for Mike and Cynthia. Dan, I want to ask you a question. Obviously, you guys have signed up a tremendous amount of new customers this year. And when you think about those customers you know, renewing, uh, hopefully in a year from now or maybe even sooner, is there a cadence when, if they didn't want to discuss sort of the broader agreement cloud, that they start thinking about it? Meaning, you know, when you think about 12 months from now and you have you know, all these new customers you just signed up, you know, is there, I'm just kind of curious historically what you've seen in terms of the cadence, whether it's been 6, 9, 12, 18 months. And I guess when you go back into those accounts, is it the same person or is your account manager, you really need to navigate the organization to maybe sell a little bit higher, you know, when you start talking about the agreement cloud. I'm just kind of curious about how that maybe plays out in your mind over the next uh, you know, year or two. Thanks. Yeah, so it's a good question, and as you might uh, imagine, the first answer is it depends, right? It depends a lot yep. on the size of the customer uh, and the vertical, for sure. But uh, I'll try to give you some, uh, again, higher level, uh, we'll call them averages, to give you some perspective about it. Uh, in general, uh, you know, customers come in and they sign up, and there's some process before adoption happens. It's one of the reasons you've heard Mike talk a lot about our investments and customer success. The faster we get people to adopt, they quickly get that strong ROI people get from DocuSign, and then they start looking for more opportunities to grow. Um, and so what we tend to find is on the smaller customers, you know, they're, they're there within a month. You know, we're adopted going quickly. In some of the larger enterprise customers, it might be several months because they have like a program manager that gets involved, right? There's a lot of process that occurs. And so, so that's, that's probably the biggest determinant of why there's variability in that time. And then once people start adopting uh, and driving the success of those first use cases, the next biggest determinant on the timing is how much they bought. So if some people had that initial land that was quite small and was conservative, then before they get to the end of the year, they're coming back and they're buying more if they've uh, implemented that first project effectively, as most do. Um, if some people have said, you know, we want to be aspirational in our first buy, they might be in a situation, they might also do a multi-year contract if it's an enterprise player, uh, but they might do a three-year buy and they won't be talking to us for two years. Right? So there's a lot of variability depending on how much they bought and, and how aspirational they were in those initial volumes. And that's a very signature-centric answer. So let me switch gears and talk a little about the rest of the agreement cloud. So again, if you're a you know, uh, SMB that came to us on the web, we're, we're not trying to sell you a broader agreement cloud story at this point. We have some additional enhancements that we have. So if you're in the Salesforce ecosystem, as an example, we have a prepare product uh, for Salesforce, which is great. But, but we're not generally coming back to those people and saying, Let's talk to you about CLM because it's a you know, mom and pop business. But as you start getting to the larger customers, um, they, if they did land with Signature, and particularly what's happened you know, with COVID, as I talked about earlier, so many of these lands have been Signature-centric. We now will be coming back to them six, nine months in saying, let's talk about expansion on Signature because that's our land and expand model. But let's also start reminding you one of the reasons you went with DocuSign was you were excited about 
that longer-term vision of agreement cloud and see that starting to play. So I think across that year, it'll be weighted towards the end of the year, but you'll see mm -hmm. us in that you know, nine, 12 months from today with the wins we're bringing in, looking for expansion opportunity for Signature for all of them and Signature plus agreement cloud expansion uh, for the mid-market and larger customers. That, that's very helpful. And if I guess just one other follow-up, uh, obviously, you know, incredible growth this year. You're a much bigger company. You're growing cash flow at a faster rate. Does that change any of the way you think about M&A or, or some of the things you might have had, you know, five years from now, maybe pulling those forward in terms of, you know, either, you know, it sounds like Mike going international, it sounds like you're speeding that process up. But is there anything, I guess, from a balance sheet perspective that really changes just given the, the kind of growth you've had and, frankly, the, the higher free cash flow that you're now generating? Yeah, not, nothing for me that's in a significant way. You know, one of the things when we started doing uh, acquisitions, uh, you know, two years ago, uh, is when we announced uh, Spring CM and sort of the, the newer DocuSign, or at least within you know my time here coming up on four years, was saying, hey guys, we're not going to become you know some massive acquisition machine. What we want to do is smart deals that we can digest effectively, and we want to have a very high batting average on successful deals. We've now done our third deal. Um, to be honest, I would have thought we might have been a little bit of a wait before the third deal. Um, the deal was not very large uh, for bringing in you know the notary capability with Live Oak. Um, but I feel good about the deal sizes we're doing. Um, it's true with our balance sheet. We, we could probably open ourselves up to much larger deals economically, but we don't really think about it economically. We think about it from a customer success standpoint. What do our, our customers want and fulfilling our vision of the agreement cloud? And one of the things that's tricky is um, when you talk about all the companies in the broadly defined agreement cloud, there aren't other DocuSigns. There aren't other very large uh, players. So I don't think there's a sort of a population of big deals that we would see at this point in time is being in that agreement cloud vision. Is it possible over time, you know, we'll continue to grow and expand and become more, you know, uh, expansionary than the agreement cloud and then therefore look at, you know, maybe more significant size deals? I, I wouldn't rule that out, but as I look into what's visible, I feel really good about the strategy you have right now. The deals we're doing, I think, are high quality. They're on strategy for us. And I think if we look out into the possible future deals, they'll probably be more, more in that ballpark of size because that's just the size of where companies are in the agreement cloud landscape. I don't know, Mike, if you have any different views, but I, I feel good about where we are right now. Then. No, I totally agree. Yeah. Your next question comes from the line of Kosh Rangan with Bank of America Merrill Lynch. Please proceed with your question. Thank you very much. Congratulations on the superb quarter. Uh, you, you ramped up your op margins. You ramped up your free cash flows. Your sales productivity is, uh, at least from what I can tell, all-time high. I'm curious to, to, to see if you can expand upon the things that helped sales productivity in the quarter, whether you measure through the lens of billings or revenue, and how sustainable are these trends? And finally, does it change your view of the long-term operating model uh, to the upside? Well, let me talk a little bit about uh, the sales productivity side, and then, Mike, you can talk about uh, if you're willing to change our long-term operating model on the call for CAD. I'm not sure, but we'll see. Uh, your uh, outgoing time as uh, CFO, uh, Lee Cynthia Gift. Um, you know, my perspective is that I think the success we've had uh, in terms of sales productivity is, is, to be really clear, it's been the secondary goal. The primary goal has been growth, and we've told you we want to continue to invest to achieve the apex of that growth. Now, at the scale we've achieved, guys, we, we feel we see opportunity for productivity improvement. Um, it, but it's, I'll tell you, it's not our focus. Our focus is still on meeting this significant demand opportunity. But just with that scale, it, it sort of just comes to us. So my view is that we haven't done anything dramatically differently there. There's been a little bit of a focus that I've been pushing onto that team to say, let's think about overlays. Let's think about complexity. As we grow this business, let's make sure we don't get so much complexity in the business that we lose our ability to simply execute. Uh, and so I think that focus there on, on uh, sort of simplification is probably having a, a, you know, a nice little positive impact, and then scale is the other aspect that's driving uh, the productivity there. In terms of that impact on the long-term model, my, my starting point would be we kind of forecast that this was going to happen, and I think it's playing out pretty much consistently with the long-term uh, you know, model and the path that Mike had built, but uh, I'll give him the option to comment on that if he sees it differently. Yeah, no, it, just as a reminder, our long-term operating margin uh, model shows 20 to 25% uh, 
um, over a roughly four-year time frame, and I think we're still tracking to 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 that target with during that period of time, as we've always said, it being a, a, a period where we anticipate an opportunity for high growth, we're going to continue to invest in all those uh, drivers. Your next question comes from the line of Michael Turin with Wells Fargo. Please proceed with your question. Hey, thanks and good afternoon. Certainly an impressive quarter, so congrats to the team from our end as well. Um, maybe another one on the execution side. was hoping you could maybe compare and contrast the first half of the year, given the bigger surge in demand you're seeing. And we all saw a big shift in having to pivot over to remote work on the fly last quarter. Were there things you were able to improve internally here in Q2 as we, we settle into this new way of working that made the execution even better, given the acceleration you're delivering here on, on some of the key metrics? Thank you. I mean, my point of view is I, I think we're continuing to execute well. I think uh, it's harder, quite frankly, uh, doing everything in a remote environment, and I think it's, it's taxing on our people. It's harder work for uh, for all of us. And and to be you know blunt about it, I think uh, we mostly like to get back into a situation where we are mostly uh, able to be in the office. I think the the world's changed a little bit, and we'll probably have in the longer run highly productive system where some people are increasing their a little bit of time out of the office because we've, we've, we've shown that we can still be productive in that uh, environment. But from, from an efficiency standpoint, I think we'd actually be now uh, even more efficient if we could be back in the office and have some of those collaboration benefits. From the standpoint of translate to the financial results, um, again, I don't think there's anything that's played out in these financials that I would say were accelerated efficiency because of um, you know remote work I suppose the only thing I would point to is sort of an obvious is that we don't have the T&E expense, um, and that has been somewhat uh, of improvement, but we've actually spent some of those savings on other things, both for funding growth as well as uh, supporting our employees uh, uh, in terms of things like helping them with the DocuSign Cares program, helping them uh, set up an, a home office in a way that allows them to be productive at home. Um, so, but I, I don't have anything else about it that would seem different to me from that standpoint. I don't know if you do, Mike. Or... The only other thing I would mention is, um, is we are learning as, as we go. We see things, for example, like attrition rates uh, that we plan and budget for. Um, we were outperforming those. Our attrition is much better than what was planned. A, because I think people really like working for DocuSign, and B, I think in the current environment, uh, people aren't as, as mobile uh, as they would be during the norm. Uh, we're seeing things like our uh, spending related to uh, paid time off. People aren't taking as much paid time off because, of course, they're working from home, and, and that just doesn't make a lot of sense. There's not a lot of places to travel. So to Dan's point, there's a lot of the ins and the outs um, that we're seeing in the model. So I think as we plan for fiscal 22, and we're obviously entering that, that phase right now, you're right, there is a lot of learning going on uh, that's going to allow us, I think, to, um, uh, to hit the mark in terms of how we should think about spending for the coming year. Your next question comes from the line of Shebli Serafi with FBM Securities. Please proceed with your question. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, so this is, this is a quite an impressive report. Uh, against a more difficult uh, comparison, um, you accelerated your growth, and, and the acceleration was broad-based. It was in direct. It was in web. It was international. And so my question is, how much of this, this acceleration was due to COVID, and how much was due to other factors like you mentioned, increased demand seen in Europe? Yeah, I would I would say, uh, Shebley, of course, we're looking as carefully as we can into the numbers to try to glean that out. Um, I am comfortable saying the following. Uh, we came into the year with a, a fiscal plan, um, and with or without COVID, our performance is exceeding that plan uh, across the globe. Um, obviously, once you put the pandemic effect and the work from home effect on top of that, it's, it's uh, generating these much higher uh, growth numbers. But, um, but we were exceeding our planned results uh, pre and, and post. Ladies and gentlemen, we have reached the end of the question and answer session, and I would like to turn the call back to Mr. Dan Springer for closing remarks. Thank you very much, and I really appreciate you all being here today. Uh, it's been a fantastic quarter, and we will look forward to seeing you or most likely uh, seeing you through video uh, in the coming months uh, until we see you next quarter. And just spend one last time, I'd like to thank Mike again for his incredible leadership over five years of stewarding the financial ship here, 
and I can't tell you how excited I am to look forward as we build the international business together. Thank you all. This concludes today's conference. You may disconnect your lines at this time. Thank you for your participation.